everybody, Luke from METS here. Uh, today I'm going to take you through a, a real life case study to show you some aerobic chronic adaptation. So a quick background, uh, the data we're looking at is the pre-testing data from, from an athlete, uh, a triathlete, he does 70.3 racing, so it's a 1.9 kilometre swim, a 90 kilometre bike and then a half marathon back to back to back. For this athlete it takes uh, around about four and a half to five hours depending on how fit he is. Now, we did a, if you do a knees analysis, obviously aerobic power is going to be the most important fitness component for this athlete. So we want to do a valid test for that, which is a VO2 max test, very similar to a beep test. Uh, so what we did was that the protocol, as you can see, we started off at 12 kilometers per hour, and then every every three minutes, we went up by 1K. So 12 Ks for three minutes, 13 for three, 14 for three, so on and so forth. Uh, before the training implementation, uh, you can see that we lasted 19 minutes, a max heart rate of 198. We got one minute into 18 kilometers per hour, which is 320 pace. And uh, we had a, an absolute VO2 of 4,150. Divide that by body weight, we get our relative VO2, which is that number everyone likes to look at, at 57.6. Now, obviously, the training intervention, um, we want to do aerobic style training. So just the, the core basics, we want to do continuous training, long interval training, hit training, um, and fartlek training are the main four that we did. So we did that. We put that into his training schedule. He did four months of training, and then we came back and did uh, the exact same testing again, where you can see here we started off at the same, 12 k's an hour. Every three minutes went up by one. This time, instead of 19 minutes, he lasted 22 minutes. Uh, his max heart rate was actually significantly lower. I'll come back to that shortly. However, his VO2 was 65.9 compared to 57 or whatever it was before. And he lasted a full three minutes longer. So he finished off the full 18 k's an hour stage and got to 19 k's an hour. So clearly he has performed better post-training. He has positively adapted. Let's go through the data. So VO2 max, first of all, it's the maximum volume of oxygen that we can take in, transport, and utilize in one minute. So that takes into, our, into account our three uh, responses that you've got to take it in, which is our respiratory chronic adaptations or respiratory acute responses. Then we've got to transport it through the cardiovascular system, and then we need to take it up by the muscles, the muscular system. So there's the three things. You can see here in the blue is our pre-data or our pre-testing data, and then we've got our post-training data here in the orange. So um, this athlete's oxygen consumption was, was basically identical all the way throughout. You, you still expect that. Like It still takes the same amount of oxygen to run at 13 or 14 or 15 k's now before and after training. But the difference is post-training in the orange that his VO2 max is higher. He got up to 65.9. He has a higher aerobic power. Now, if you have a higher aerobic power, that means you can get more energy from the aerobic energy systems. If you can get more energy from the aerobic energy systems, you're not going to need to rely on the anaerobic glycolysis system into a higher intensity, which is going to delay the fatigue associated with an accumulation of metabolic byproducts. And you can see that in the lactate graph here. Uh, again, we've got uh, the, the pre-training program in the blue and the post-training program to so the chronically adapt data in the orange. Instantly, you can already see that, that after training, lactate is lower at rest and also at max as well. Okay, So because this athlete has a higher aerobic power, they have a higher VO2 max, they don't need to rely on their anaerobic glycolysis system as much earlier and then not until later as we increase the intensity. Now, I'm not going to ask you to find lactate inflection point on this graph. Um, it's not always that perfect curve that you might see in an exam. Uh, in fact, this athlete hit their lactate inflection point pre-training here, and post-training they actually hit it there. All right, So they've delayed their lactate inflection point by one kilometer per hour. Now obviously for exams, so on and so forth, you're going to look at uh, you know, a lip graph, which let's pick a color, it might look something like it's really, really flat, it might have a very small increase, and then it has a very big increase like that. Clearly the last point at which lactate entry equals removal is just there. As I said, in a lab, it's not always the case. We look for a two millimole jump as a guide. Um, in this example, this athlete hit their lip here after training and here before training. So they've delayed their lactate inflection point. If we go to the respiratory chronic adaptation, so we'll take a look at ventilation. So ventilation is the amount of air that we're breathing in per minute. As exercise intensity increases, clearly our ventilation goes up as well. Um, he actually had a very similar submax ventilation. Often we'll see after, your, after training, once you're more chronically adapt, that your ventilation will be lower. Often it will be lower because you have increased pulmonary diffusion. If you can actually extract more oxygen across at the alveolar capillary surface area, <clears throat> you're not going to need to breathe in as much air overall um, to get the same circulation of oxygen. So it wasn't the case in this time, and that's fine. Not, not everybody's going to, to, to show the exact same chronic adaptations. But if you did see ventilation lower when you're fitter, that's because of pulmonary diffusion increasing. 
What we do see in the ventilation number is that free training he was at 140 litres of air and post training is at 160 litres of air. So his max or close enough to. So his max ventilation increased. The reason his maximal ventilation increased is because he, he had an increased maximal tidal volume. So tidal volume is the amount of air per breath that you're breathing in. The key word air, not oxygen, it's the air per breath that we're breathing in. With training, your diaphragm gets stronger, your intercostals get stronger, your lungs can become slightly more elastic. Basically, you can you can breathe in um, and out a little bit faster when you're trained, okay, due to these, these chronic adaptations of the diaphragm, so on and so forth. So you can increase your maximal tidal volume. If you can inflate and deflate your lungs more quickly, you're going to have an increased ventilation at the maximal level. This is a very similar at submax, but, but significantly higher at the maximal intensity. Once we've taken it in, we need to transport it. So let's talk about the heart rate, cardiac output, and stroke volume. This is a really obvious change. You can see pre-training, his heart rate is quite high. Post-training, it's significantly lower. The trend is the same. As exercise intensity increases, heart rate is going to increase as well. Um, you can see that the pre-training, his max heart rate was 198. Post-training, <clears throat> his heart rate was 186. Now, for the context of VCEPE, we learned that the max heart rate doesn't change or maybe it slightly decreases. This is quite a significant decrease, as you can see. Um, so, again, in the real world, heart rate does drop a fair bit, generally speaking. But the key point is that a chronic adaptation to aerobic training is that heart rate decreases because stroke volume increases. And we can see stroke volume here. Stroke volume is uh, the amount of blood ejected from the left ventricle per beat. And you can see that post-training, his stroke volume is higher all the way throughout, even at submax, and it's higher at maximal intensity exercise. So although his heart rate is lower, his stroke volume is higher, so it actually matches out. The cardiac output submaximally will be the same. Okay, if, 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 if you're running at you know whatever sixty percent of your of your max, um, if your stroke volume goes up, your heart rate will come down. It's still the same cardiac output. So your submax cardiac output after training is still the same, just like our oxygen consumption was still the same, but at the maximal intensity, because our stroke volume is so much higher, our maximal cardiac output will be higher as well. So let's say this was perfectly typical and his heart rate was 200, uh, max heart rate was 200 pre-training and 200 post-training. Well, if you have 200 times by 21 compared to 200 times by 24, clearly the when you toss it by 24, you have a higher cardiac output. So the chronic adaptation is an increased stroke volume, which allows us to have an increased maximal cardiac output. Now, this again, this isn't typical of what you'll see in VCEPE. We learn that um, stroke volume is going to increase initially, and then it is going to plateau. So you would see something, something along the lines of this is, you know, before training, it goes up, and then it plateaus at a point. And then after training, it's exactly the same, but it's a bit higher to start with. It goes up, maximal stroke volume increases, and then it plateaus. Okay, so that's what we learn in VCEPE. Either way, you can still see that as the left ventricle size increases, that's what allows our stroke volume to increase, we're going to have an increased um, maximal cardiac output and a decreased heart rate throughout. Um, all right, so we've taken it in, we've transported it. Now we need to utilize it. So utilizing it is talking about the muscles on I do have a graph for that, but it's it's not really accurate in terms of VCEPE. So let me just draw it out old school style on paint as we are here. AVO2 difference, all right? That's all about diffusing the oxygen from the arterioles uh, into the muscles um, to extract the oxygen. So let's take a look at a typical graph here. So we might have, here's our arterioles. We might have 20 oxygen molecules coming at the arterioles. Then we might have let's say this is pre-training uh, then we might have 14 at the venules in between that we're going to have a muscle let me see if i can draw a calf muscle that'll do that's my calf muscle and we know that our capillaries are going to feed that so i'm going to do red again just because it makes sense for red so on and so forth so there's the capillary so we have 20 so we've, we've taken in we've transported the oxygen we get 20 oxygen molecules coming through the arterioles um, and then we obviously use up six. So let's write six there. Six because 14 have left. What's the AVO2 difference? The difference between A and the difference between V is six in this case. Now, what happens with uh, chronic adaptations is that this is going to increase. So let me just see if I can copy and paste this. 
So those are chronic adaptation, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, these numbers are going to change. We're still going to have the same 20 that come in, but instead of having 14, we're going to have something like maybe two. Okay. So if 20 come in and only two leave, then the ABO2 difference all of a sudden isn't six, it's actually 18. So you can see that as we chronically adapt, the same oxygen comes to the muscle, but we, it, when we have these structures in place, um, we're going to absorb more of them and waste less of them. So this is better. This is a lot better than that. And this is where the elite aerobic athletes are so much better than the rest of us. We might be able to breathe in the same amount of air. We might be able to transport a similar amount of oxygen, but they can really extract that oxygen really well. So what I want to do now is just quickly show you how that happens. Now, muscular adaptations, you could talk about, uh, you know, you could talk about um, increase in glycogen stores. You could talk about oxidative enzyme capacity. You could talk about um, even a, you could talk about slow twitch uh, type two A fibers turning into slow twitch type one fibers or expressing those characteristics. The really key one, and you can any, all of those are correct, but the really key one is increase in number size and surface area of mitochondria, in, in, slight increase in myoglobin, and increased capillarization of the muscle, which technically is a the capillarization is technically a cardiovascular response. And that's why AVO to difference can be both cardiovascular and um, muscular because the, the capillarization of the muscle, so getting more capillaries around this muscle is, is cardiovascular, but then the, the myoglobin and the, the mitochondria uh, are very much more muscular. So let's just take a look here. Um, let's say we know that chronic adaptations to aerobic training are increasing capillarization. Okay, so let's say I've got more capillaries here. Actually, before I do that, Let's draw, let's draw a mitochondria. Let's say this is my little mitochondria down here. Okay? And then I've got, uh, a, little mo I've got a couple of little myoglobins here, for example. Okay, I'm real old school with the paint. So for me to get this oxygen across, so the oxygen comes to the capillaries, and then the myoglobin will come to the capillary and take the oxygen. And then the myoglobin is going to carry that oxygen to the mitochondria, and that's how we create aerobic energy. Now, if we have not many capillaries, we have not many myoglobin, we have not many mitochondria, you can see how we're not going to extract too much. The body's not going to take more oxygen than it can, can actually use at that time. So this could be an untrained individual. But if we do the aerobic style training methods, long, um, long interval, continuous, fart leg, hit, so on and so forth, we can increase the capillaries. So what that's going to do is more capillaries around the muscle, so on and so forth, excuse my drawing, which means more oxygen supply. Now, if we have more oxygen supply, we're going to want to have more... Um, we're just going to increase the number size of surface area of these mitochondria. And then we're going to need more myoglobin to actually carry the oxygen to those mitochondria. Okay, a couple over here, a couple over here, a couple over here, so on and so forth. So if, we, if we've increased capillarization and we've increased the myoglobin to carry that, that oxygen to the mitochondria, and now we have more mitochondria, increased number size of surface area, you can see how this number is going to get closer to what it was before, which was 20 in and two out, okay? Because we've got more internal structures. We've increased the capillarization, the myoglobin content, as well as the, the number size of surface area of mitochondria. So that is the chronic adaptation. That's how we increase AVO2 difference. So, so what I want to take, what I want you to take as a summary for today is we go do some aerobic training methods. We increase our VO2 max. We've done that because we've increased, we've had respiratory chronic adaptations, pulmonary diffusion increase um, in max tidal volume. We've got uh, cardiovascular chronic adaptations, particularly increase in stroke volume, increase in max cardiac output. Um, I didn't talk about blood volume and hemoglobin, but that would increase as well. And we've got an increase in our AVO2 difference due to the capillarization, the myoglobin content, and the increased number size and surface area of mitochondria. Put them all together, and this 57.6 VO2 goes up to this 65.9 VO2. Because we have a higher aerobic power, we are going to have a lower contribution from the anaerobic glycolysis system at submax workloads, and is going to take longer for that increase in contribution to occur, which is how we've delayed lip from 16 kilometers per hour up to 17 kilometers per hour. Uh, again, this wasn't an exhaustive list of, of chronic adaptations, but this was a, a case study which probably shows about 90% of them. I hope you found that useful. Any questions, let me know, and I'll speak to you next time.